Welcome to Lesson 2.5, Postulates and Paragraph Proof. In this lesson, we are going to identify and use basic postulates about points, lines, and planes, and we will write paragraph proofs. And in this process, we'll also identify what the proof process is to kind of reinforce what we did in Lesson 2.6. You have quite a bit of new vocabulary to have filled in your vocab notebook as well as our first selection of postulates and I'll show you where to write those in your note packet in this video. But we are talking about the words postulate and axiom, proof, theorem, deductive argument, paragraph proof, and informal proof. Now some of these vocab words um, are really just another way of saying the same thing as another vocab word. Like an axiom is another word for a postulate. Uh, informal proof can be very much like a paragraph proof. All right, in lesson 2.6, we introduced the uh, second part of your vocab book where you will list properties, postulates, and theorems, and all those were in lesson 2.6 were the properties. So when we get to lesson 2.5 now, you have these vocab words, hopefully you have definitions for those, and probably they'll take most of that first page, so you won't have a whole lot of room at the bottom. So wherever that leaves off on the second page, or just at the top of the second page if you can start there, we wanted to talk about postulates and theorems. There are no properties in this lesson, so we'll just say postulates and theorems. The first seven can be found on page 127. And they don't have what we call proper names. They are just written out in sentence form after this number. This identifying number is only really good for our book. Each book can title them a little bit different. And so these postulates need to be written out most of the time. But then we do have a theorem, 2.1, that has what we call a proper name. It's called the midpoint theorem that we'll get to later in the lesson. So when you're writing these down, if anything were to ever have a proper name, go ahead and write that and underline it like I've done here. But for all these postulates, we can just refer to them by their number and then write them out in your vocab book. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at those real quickly. You should have these postulates written down. Through any two points, there's exactly one line. The next postulate is through any three non-collinear points, make sure you have specified non-collinear, there's exactly one plane. A line contains at least two points, that's a postulate. Another postulate is that a plane contains at least three non-collinear points. These postulates kind of come from the first two. And then next, if we have a plane and two points lie in that plane, then the line containing those two points also lies in that plane. Then our last two postulates, if two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly one point. And two seven, if two planes intersect, then they intersect in a line. So we're going to use these postulates, which are these mathematical ideas that do not have to be proven to be true. They just are accepted as true without proof. And we're going to use those to help us justify some statements here. So let's look at example 1a. In this figure, we're told that AC and DE are in plane Q and they're parallel. So we should be able to state whether each of these postulates is true or false and identify that postulate from your list that makes them true or false. So let's take a look at number 1. A. Exactly one plane contains points F and B and E. Well, we have F, F, B, and E. Those are non-collinear. Even though F is above that plane, these are three non-collinear points. And we have a postulate that states through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. Also, we have the one that says a plane contains at least three non-collinear points. But that first postulate, 2, 2, is what tells us this. So this is true because of postulate, you can abbreviate this, 2.2, which states through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. Part B, we have line BE, and we're told that B E, even though it's not drawn, if there's two points, we get a line. That line lies on plane Q. Well, since B and E are both in plane Q, the line containing those two points is also on plane Q. So that is true. By postulate 2.5, if two points lie in a plane, then the line containing them also lies in that plane. Why don't you try part C and D, see if you can identify if these are true or false statements, and write out the postulate that makes those true or false. Alright, this is what we should get. 
for part C. It says through points F, B, and G there's exactly one plane. The problem is that F, B, and G are collinear and postulate 2, 2 requires the three points to be non-collinear. So this is actually false. There's more than one plane containing those three points. Part D, this is true. We're told that AC and FG intersect at B. If you look at the diagram, AC, FG do intersect, and the point of their intersection is B, and since postulate 2, 6 states if two lines intersect, then they intersect in exactly one point, this is true. All right, in example two, we're doing some of the same kind of stuff, but these could be sometimes, always, or never true, and we don't have a specific diagram to look at. And so we are just making general statements about these uh, points that exist somewhere, but we don't actually see them in a diagram. We are to explain our reasoning, again, by citing some different postulates. So let's take a look at 1a. There's exactly one plane containing points a, b, and c. Well, without knowing any more about these, this could be true or false depending on whether a, b, and c are collinear. So this is a sometimes true. And it depends on whether or not a, b, and c are collinear collinear. And that's postulate 2.2. Next, points E and F are contained in exactly one line. This is always true because of postulate 2.1. Through any two points there's exactly one line. Why don't you try C through F on your own and then when you are ready you can continue watching the video to check your answers. All right, here are the answers we should get. If we have two lines intersecting in at all, they intersect in exactly one point. So this is never true by postulate 2.6. Part D it says the intersection of plane M and N is a point. Well, that's not true because of postulate 2.7. If we have two planes intersecting, they intersect in a line, not just a point. So that's never true. Part E, if A and B lie in plane W, then line AB lies in plane W. That's always true by postulate 2.5. And similarly, part F, if TR is to lie in plane M, that can sometimes be true. Postulate 2.5 requires that T and R, both of those points, must be on plane M. All right, let's take a look at the proof process. In writing proofs and kind of using these postulates and properties and things like that to help make arguments, our deductive arguments, there are five steps we must go through. First, we need to list the given information and if possible draw a diagram to illustrate that information. Okay, and that's where we are given our statements, that's like our, our hypothesis. Step two is to state the theorem or conjecture to be proven and a lot of the times we'll put both of these pieces together. And then in step three, we can create our deductive argument by forming logical chain of statements linking the given to what you are trying to prove. We want to create a chain that is linked together. I can't skip links in the chain of logic without uh, summing those up. In step four, we're going to justify every statement we make to including definitions, algebraic properties, postulates, and theorems. And lastly, we're going to state what we were trying to prove as proven. So we're going to keep this in mind as we try and construct our proofs. And in lesson 2-6, you learned how to put together two column proofs for algebraic proofs and geometric proofs in which you list your statements on one side, reasons on the other. But a lot of times it's a little bit easier just to write out your proof in paragraph form. And so this is how we're going to do that. We're given that M is the midpoint of XY. We need to write a paragraph proof to show that XM is congruent to MY. So the first thing we need to do in our proof process is state the given. M is the midpoint of XY and state what it is that we're trying to prove. XM is congruent to MY. Now, a lot of times it's good to put a diagram with that. So we know from our diagram these have to be congruent, we just have to be able to explain that. So here's how we're going to put that in paragraph form. Our first sentence can read like this, since M is the midpoint of XY, XM equals MY by definition.
And since we know that these are equal, if two segments have equal measures, then they are congruent by definition. So xm is congruent to my, and I've already given my reason before that. And so this is the body of the proof, and then we have finally proven what we set out to prove in that final statement, but it all fits nicely in one paragraph. Now, that proof helps us explain this theorem. If we have m as the midpoint of a segment, AB, then AM is congruent to MB. This is not our definition in the strict wording that we were given earlier in this uh, course for midpoint, but we've gotten this information from that definition, and so this is what a theorem is. Okay, Our theorem comes from other postulates and ideas and definitions and is a new idea that we can now move on and use in other proofs. All right, so now we have the midpoint theorem. We just proved that in example three. So we can use that theorem in other proofs. Whenever we're told that we have a midpoint, we can make a conclusive statement like this because of this theorem. And so this could be a reason in a theorem now, the midpoint, or a reason in a proof, the midpoint theorem. All right, so we've got one more example to try. If we're given this diagram and we're given that B is the midpoint of AC, go ahead and mark the diagram like that, but also C is the midpoint of BD, so we can mark all three of those like that, we should be able to prove that AB equals CD. So I want you to take a look at that. The given information is this. B is the midpoint of AC and C is the midpoint of BD, and we're supposed to prove that AB equals CD. Notice we're talking about midpoints, talking then about the equality of their lengths. So here's how we should start our proof. We want to begin by just stating the given. Since B is the midpoint of AC and C is the midpoint of BD, notice I'm using the word since because in my sentence I'm going to imply that something else follows that. Since I know that B is the midpoint of AC, and C is the midpoint of BD, I can make another statement to eventually lead me to something talking about these lengths. Well, by definition we know AB equals BC and then BC also equals CD. We can just say by definition. That's where the period goes right there. So now that we know these two are equal and these two are equal, you might remember back to lesson 2-6 that we have a property that allows us to move from AB equaling BC to just the fact that AB has to equal CD. You might remember the name of that property is the transitive property. So I can start my next sentence like this. By the transitive property of equality, I can still abbreviate, and we have finished our proof because we have stated what it is we were trying to prove. All right, that's how we put together paragraph proofs. I do want to remind you about what the proof process looks like. You always want to start by stating your given information and drawing a diagram if it helps, then state what it is you're trying to prove. Then we create our argument, and then we also want to justify every statement we give with a reason. And then lastly, we want to make sure we have proven what it is we set out to prove from step two.